Dr. Yuri Foshtinsky is a prominent author, historian and journalist and expert on Russia and the former Soviet Union. He has appeared in hundreds of print, TV and radio interviews worldwide and is widely known as co-author of the book Blowing Up Russia with Alexander Litvinenko, a former lieutenant colonel in the FSB who was poisoned with radioactive polonium in London in 2006. His latest book, Blowing Up Ukraine, The Return of Russian Terror and the Threat of World War III, was researched before the invasion of Ukraine, but is one of the first comprehensive investigations into the lethal methods Russia used since 1999 to take over Ukraine. And of course, we are talking today in the wake of another huge terrorist atrocity in Russia. And as ever, things do not uh, turn out perhaps as simple as they seem on the surface. We're going to be diving into what we know so far about that event. Welcome to Silicon Curtain Podcast. Please like, subscribe, and definitely comment on the videos to help people discover the incredible speakers and their insights. Um, Yuri, I'm delighted to welcome you back to the channel because you've, you've been on a couple of times. And if people enjoy this interview, then I advise them very strongly to look at the other interviews and, of course, to check out your books, which are extraordinarily insightful. Thank you. Well, let's start with the Terror Act. I mean, we've got lots of stuff going on and, and some of it may actually be connected with this, things like the elections and the death of Navalny and so on. But we'll come to those in a minute. Let's start with similar terror acts. And there's a universal question we have to ask. If you look at Bethlan or the atrocity at North Ost, the theater that happened uh, in the uh, early 2000s, the key question always is, is it incompetence on behalf of the security forces that, that these events, you know, reach such a terrible scale of tragedy? Or is it intentional? That seems to be a common thread of discussion. Well, this is a question, of course, for which uh, we are looking for an answer. It's probably too early to come to conclusions. Uh, what we know at this point is that on 7th of March, the U.S. Uh, government or officials uh, basically warned the, the FSB that uh, a terrorist act probably might be happening in Moscow in the near future. Uh, of course, after this, uh, Putin uh, gave a speech to the collegium of the FSB. This is, is kind of politburo of the ruling uh, structure, right? The, the Communist Party had politburo. The, the FSB has collegium. It's an old structure. It was created in 1918 by Felix Dzerzhinsky. Uh, we do not really know about this structure too, too much. We, we know who, who is included, but we do not know what they discuss. So basically, Putin was saying that this is a provocation and this is the attempt of the United States to dis, you know, distract uh, people's uh, focus on elections, etc., and we should ignore it. I think after 24 years of uh, Putin in power, uh, people around him know that if you are incompetent, uh, you would survive. But if you are not loyal, uh, you will be forced out. So I do not think that after again 24 years, well, 25th year, in power, somebody would question uh, Putin's opinion. And if he said that this is a provocation and we shouldn't pay attention to this, I think no one paid attention to this. And then, as we know, the terrorist act took place. Now, it took place in a place where uh, Trump organized his Miss Universe uh, event in 2013. So it's a well-known place outside Moscow. Uh, you are not able to, to, you know, to have a terrorist, uh, to, to have an operation there to organize terrorist act there if you are not local. This is impossible. So the statements which we have from the Russian government so far, that all people uh, who were arrested in connection to the terrorist act are foreigners, uh, is misleading. They are probably foreigners, but they might be in places in from countries like Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, you know, former Soviet republics. 
So they are foreigners, technically speaking. But uh, if you plan to have a terrorist attack uh, in uh, Krokus City Hall, you have to know Moscow, you have to know that particular building. So uh, the, the help probably was organized from inside. Uh, we we were named several people who seems to be, again, people from uh, former Asian Soviet republics, um, meaning that they're not Russian. Uh, they, they're definitely not Ukrainians. So the attempt of the Russian government to to start to claim that Ukraine has something to do with this uh, is, is a fiction. Ukraine has nothing to do with this. And if, well, if Ukrainians would organize this kind of operation, they probably would attack uh, Astankina or some you know, other buildings in, in Moscow, like uh, Ministry of Defense or Lubyanka building. So this, are not, this has nothing to do with Ukrainians, of course. Uh, now, the question is, if the FSB was involved in preparation of this uh, terrorist attack, uh, again, this happened before. This happened uh, prior to the first Chechen war, and then how the first Chechen war was, you know, announced and started claiming that Chechen were in, Chechens were involved in terrorist acts in Moscow in 1994. That's how the second Chechen war was started. It started with uh, terrorist acts uh, of September 99 in Russia. And uh, after this, of course, Putin announced the second Chechen war uh, and came to power as the president on the wave of this kind of patriotism or whatever, the, the unity of Russian people behind the government. And I, I think by, by now it's clear to everybody that Chechens had nothing to do with those terrorist acts of September of 99. And indeed, this was FSB, which was behind. And uh, again, there are some uh, we, we wrote a book with Alexander Litvinenko about this, but this is not the main argument and the main, uh, you know, main uh, proof that this was done by the FSB. The main proof that this was done by the FSB was presented by FSB itself, uh, because Chechens were not involved in that terrorist attack, even if you trust FSB's conclusion, even according to their investigations, Chechen were not involved, not a single Chechen was involved. And then, of course, the war started the day when two uh, FSB operatives were caught red hand in Rizan uh, with the attempt to blow up a building, another apartment building uh, in, in Rizan. So I think we have enough proof to claim that the Chechen, Second Chechen War was started after the, you know, terrorist act conducted by the FSB. What, what I'm saying is this. It's too early to say, it's too early to claim. Uh, we have to see how the Russian government would use, if they plan to do this, this terrorist uh, attack uh, uh, in their own interest. For example, if we will see in the near future, like a week from now, two weeks from now, an attempt of the Russian parliament to uh, introduce a death sentence for terrorism, then we would know, like 100% we would know, that this was done by the Russian government in order to return death penalty, because there were several statements by Dmitry Medvedev, former president and former prime minister, in his Telegram channel, where he basically is saying that the fact that Russia doesn't have death penalty prevents the government fight, fight you know, successfully against enemies, uh, both local, uh, domestic and foreign. So if we see something like this, this would be an indication for us that the terrorist attack probably was organized by the FSB. Uh, if, if we see that the group of 
people involved uh, might be huge and might include some uh, Russian, you know, names, right? Or uh, then uh, there is a possibility again that this was done either by the FSB or by some extremist within uh, military structures or state security structures who who would like to well to wake up Russians living in Moscow because you see the irony is that Russia is involved in a war which is very expensive in terms of life as well uh, by all by all calculations uh, you know we're talking about hundreds of thousands people killed and Moscow is kind of artificially left aside and lives normal life and when when you talk to Moscovites they basically explain you that nothing is happening they do not feel this war they're not part of this war and it's not by chance until uh yesterday morning I believe uh it, it was uh, prohibited to call this invasion a war. Uh, I, I think uh, it just now Dmitry Peskov for the first time used the war describing what's happening in, in Ukraine, right? So, but Russians are continuing to go to concerts, to, to go to restaurants, to go to, to visit exhibitions, as if nothing is happening. So this is a wake up call for Moscow as well, of course. And I'm sure that now a lot of people in Moscow understand finally that, that well, something is going on around, right? That it's, it, it's not business as usual. But uh, but again, it's too early to say whether this is ISIS or not because it's it doesn't look like a typical ISIS operation because in a typical ISIS operation, terrorists do not really think about surviving during the attack. They are mainly thinking about killing more and more and more and more people. And in this case, we obviously see terrorists who are not, you know, trained enough, who are trying to, to escape, who are leaving the place even before they, they uh, you know, end to kill as many people as they could. Uh, so everything is possible, I guess. All, all the ISIS never, I believe, never organized operations in places like Russia. There are still questions how those people are trained automatic weapons, because it's not very simple in today's Moscow, which is, you know, which exists in, in a form of a war still, right? And uh, taking into account that Americans, you know, warn them about possibility of the terrorist acts. It's, it's difficult to believe that this was organized from abroad. It was not. It was not. Uh, so we have to see how many locals uh, were involved and what kind of locals this are. But but mainly we have to see if the government would try to use it. And, and this is why they. Yeah. This is why the timing of the terror act, uh, if 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 there indeed is intentional timing behind it, and we don't know uh, if it's planned or not, it's probably going to become clear. Uh, through more details, but also the reaction of the regime to it. Is it possible that this could be used as a kind of Reichstag moment, a moment which allows Putin to escalate uh, even further than he already has the kind of violence and aggression that he's projecting out into Ukraine and possibly into, into other places, whether or not he had involvement in the planning, execution and the timing of it, it is nonetheless something that can be utilized, um, especially coming after the election. It would have been perhaps be, been far more damaging during or before the election. Um, but it's happened after the election, and it's happened to the point where it's being acknowledged this is a war, and where it's quite clear that if Russia is going to make any kind of further gains, it is going to need to mobilize on a substantial scale, not just the economy that's already mobilized for war, but as you say, gather a lot more cannon meat or fodder to move forward. Well, first of all, uh, you, you're, you're correct. Uh, I, I, I think if this would be 
If this, this would be a traditional terrorist act uh, organized by terrorists, whatever, with certain political goals, of course, this would be uh, happening either during the elections or before the elections, because then you actually obviously trying to, you know, to, to damage Russian stability prior to elections of Putin. When we do this after elections, it's kind of too, too, too late. It doesn't make any sense. But uh, if we, are, we are going to see, and I think we will see it very, very soon, uh, if the Russian government would try to use this terrorist acts for for certain uh, political or, or practical uh, objections uh, to mobilization of the army is a serious uh, matter. Uh, Ukrainians are struggling uh, now in a situation when Americans stopped uh, assistance, unfortunately, and. Uh, it doesn't look that Biden would be able to break uh, this situation and to 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 change it and to to you know to come with assistance. I think Republicans who are operating under Trump instructions, uh, which I'm seriously saying this by the way, absolutely, which I'm sure came from Kremlin, came from Putin to Trump, and I think this was one of the reasons that Carson went to Moscow to conduct interview from Putin. And I think this is one of the reasons uh, Viktor Orban visited Trump uh, recently. This, way, this was a way uh, to, to have this conversation between Putin and Trump, which is probably not very easy to do uh, now under all this attention which is paid by by media to to both trump and and putin uh so um if there is no american help uh ukrainians uh, will be in in difficult situation and if russia would be able to mobilize additional hundred thousand troops again you you need to train them you need to equip them it's not so easy it's not so quick these are not this is not going to be hundred thousand of professional, well-trained troops. But nevertheless, uh, uh, they have so far probably 600,000 people fighting in Ukraine. So this additional 100,000 still is, is a lot. Uh, uh, Ukrainians will be under pressure. And uh, what, what Putin is saying is, if you remember what Putin was saying uh, during his interview with uh, Carlson that if uh, the West stops the assistance to Ukraine, he will take it within, you know, within several weeks. Uh, I, the, the, I do not, of course, think that that's how it's going to be. But what's important is that Putin believes that if it's not for uh, assistance, uh, then Ukraine will be taken, you know, within weeks. That's why it's important for him to stop this assistance by any means. That's why he's frightening uh, Europe and the world with nuclear strikes. That's why he's, uh, you know, asking Trump to stop this assistance by any means, because he believes that this is the key to his uh, victory. And if he is victorious in Ukraine, then again, his, uh, his mind uh, tells him that, well, if the West uh, loses Ukraine, then of course, all other countries will surrender without fight because now they would know that it's impossible to fight against the Russian Federation, which is ready to fight forever if it's necessary. So that's, that's what's the problem. Uh, is and um, and and unfortunately, I I do not uh, I do not see any you know light at the end of tunnel uh, at least in the near future. I I I believe that at the end uh, Russia will widen the front and they will try of course through Odessa to get to Moldova uh, to to have a similar war 
in Moldova, and Moldova, of course, is much weaker than, than Ukraine. Uh, I even was thinking that probably the, the easiest way to avoid Russian invasion into Moldova is for Moldova to unify it with Romania, because for those people who, who doesn't know, this is, this is the same language, the same people, the same country. It just kind of artificially was divided into two. Uh, but uh, but if Moldova would find a way to unify with Romania, then they would become automatically members of NATO as a part of Romania, and this probably would prevent the war. Uh, but, but again, for this, you need a very uh, quick and tough political decisions. You probably would have to conduct referendums in Moldova, referendums in Romania. You know, I mean, Europe should be for it, the United States should not oppose. But, but th this is the way, uh, you know, this is the way uh, to prevent a war because look, <laughs> looking back looking back at the, at the history of the second world war you know you see historians usually find several beautiful ways to stop it right in time and the same could be said about the, the invasion of 22 uh, in ukraine into ukraine there were ways to stop that war before it started but um, and it seems to be very simple usually when you when we look at this as historians, so so the, 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 to prevent a war uh, of Russian Federation uh, war against Moldova is a kind of simple, but it's an unconventional way to deal with it. Um, but but that's the, the the time. I believe the time changed after twenty fourth of February twenty two. We we started to live in a different world, and we we have to understand this, and uh, we have to uh, to behave differently. And uh, Macron's uh, evolution uh, from a person who was calling to Putin every other day when the war started, asking him to to stop the war. Right to 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 find other ways to talk to the Ukrainians to, you know, to uh, when he was Macron was hoping probably that Ukraine would uh, agree to capitulate or to give part of territories to avoid the war, right? Uh, to uh, for him uh, now to say that he is thinking about sending NATO troops into Ukraine. I mean, it's it's a long road, it's a long road. But this is an indication for us uh, that twenty uh, fourth of February twenty two uh, changed many things for Europe, and uh, we we need to do everything we we have uh, to stop another war in Europe because we we know that both wars in Europe, first and second one, were ab absolutely devastating for 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 Europe as for continent and, and we have to stop it and we still have to we still have chance to stop it right but for this we have to uh to to make very extraordinary decisions you know to think out of box and uh, we, we have to do it we have no choice otherwise we will have a full-scale war in the near future and already we see Putin uh trying to point the finger towards Ukraine, although some of the evidence coming out and the apparent admission by ISIS-K that uh, it was their strike, their fighters, etc., seems to uncut that message of Putin. Now, this, is, this is potentially interesting, isn't it? Because we always think of Putin's regime as, a, as an absolute vertical, with him controlling everything that goes on and being in some ways omniscient and pulling all of the strings. And of course, it is a kind of vertical hierarchy. But at the same time, it has been argued that Putin is often very slow to make decisions. He's cautious in some ways, um, even in the lengthy war in Donbass, there were people urging him to throw more resources and more scale at the problem and to an extent he outsourced war and terror um 
to Girkin and his forces and didn't fully commit. And he has been described sometimes as being fairly indecisive rather than the sort of strong leader. Is there at all the possibility that if this was not a so-called sort of organic, genuine terror attack, then it may be a way of putting pressure on Putin to go for the full mobilization, to go for full war, which is something he has visibly avoided doing in two years of the full-scale military operation. Well, this is already what's happening, right? So, uh, again, we do not know if there is a direct connection with the terrorist act or not, but number one, uh, Peskov uh, named the, the aggression in Ukraine a war. Uh, number two, it was announced that Russia would need additional 100,000 people uh, mobilized uh, for for the war in, in Ukraine. Uh, so... Uh, it's uh, it's a lot. I mean, hundred thousand people is a lot. It's a lot for Russia and for Russian economy because last time, when it was announced that Russia would mobilize three hundred thousand people initially to for the war in Ukraine, uh, not only those three hundred thousand people, of course, were mobilized, but additional three hundred thousand people or maybe more left the country to avoid the draft. Uh, we should expect something similar now, uh, especially because Moscow stopped to be a safe town. You see, uh, the Russian government uh, purposely uh, doesn't draft uh, people from Mor Moscow from St. Petersburg uh, because they do not want these two cities you know, to feel the war. And if you start to draft people from those cities and uh, bodies are coming back, then people in Moscow and St. Petersburg start to feel the war. Uh, I do not know if this would still continue, the, this uh, tactics. So maybe they still would avoid to draft uh, young people from Moscow. But, but the fact that Moscow just, uh, you know, witness a terrorist, attack and a very blandy one uh, indicates that Moscow is not a, a safe city anymore. So what I'm saying is that in addition to 100,000 people whom they would try to draft, uh, we probably will see another 100,000 people emigrating from Russia because the border is still open. Uh, now, these are people, these are young men who are taken from the Russian economy. And Russian economy, as we know, is working 24 uh, hours, seven days a week to support the war. So this this probably, this might be noticed by, by, by population, by country, by economy. This is not going to be a, a free walk. Uh, so it's it seems to be that after elections, Putin is going to to apply more pressure for for the population, right? To you know, to 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 support the, his war activity and his war policy. Um, he doesn't he doesn't fight for popularity. He doesn't care. He really doesn't care how many people are killed. And historically. Unfortunately, Russia is usually losing in, in any war more than any other participant. And uh, usually we are talking about millions. Putin is not there yet. Uh, so he has still, you know, a, a, a road to follow, uh, following like Stalin, for example. If, if this is uh, his ideal, and it probably is, but uh, but it's questionable if uh, if uh, Russia would be able to hold uh, th this increase of uh, pressure. Uh, we will we will see, of course. We will see. It's uh, I'm skeptical about the uh, ability of uh, Russia to change the regime. Uh, you know, in, through internal opposition or internal uprising, I do not think that's what we are going to witness. I think all those people who 
who are against the regime actually left the country because that's what you know that's what probably practical approach should dictate you to do because it makes no sense to fight against Putin because you may fight with him only with weapons in your hands and look what happened with Navalny who was you know trying to fight with the regime uh, peacefully and uh, and weapons of course are only in hands of uh, three structures uh, you know the FSB the, the so-called uh, Ross Guardia and that's another structure created by Putin like his personal guards and and the army but army traditionally doesn't play any politics in, in, in Russia and the FSB of course is under Putin's control so there are no forces um, in Russia to oppose Putin he knows this that's how they were you know, building this uh, since 2000. So the reality is that there is no opposition and they may do whatever they want. And uh, un unfortunately, what they want is to have this permanent war against the West. And that's what they plan to do. They, they're not going to stop. They're not going to change. They, they're going to proceed with the speed which is allowed by, by events. Again, when they invaded Ukraine in February of 22, the plan was that Ukraine will be taken or capitulating in a week or two, and then Russia would proceed further in Moldova and then to the Baltic states. But as we know, Ukrainians are holding for, for more than two years now, and the speed with which Russia is proceeding the invasion, of course, is much, much slower than it was expected. But instead of changing the goals of the foreign policy for the Russian Federation, they basically, they're not changing those goals, and they just are uh, changing the, the tactics that, well, then instead of Blitzkrieg, we are going to have permanent war. But we will win at the end, or if not, we will kill everybody because we are nuclear power, and then if we are not able to win, we just destroy everybody. So that this is the approach, and this is the approach which is kind of um, proclaimed to us by both uh, Vladimir Putin and Dmitry Medvedev, who is very outspoken in, in his Telegram channel, and I actually ask everybody who would like to understand what Russia is thinking about the rest of the world to read those texts. They, they are e e extremely cruel, <laughs> but very useful for understanding. Um, so this is a serious war. And so it's not by chance Peskov finally agreed to call it a war. Uh, this is a war, and I think uh, the... I think the, the open full-scale war between NATO and Russia is inevitable unless, and I do not think that that's what's going to happen, unless US government would change strategy, strategy immediately and instead of, um, instead of uh, having as a strategy a situation when Russia is not losing the war and Ukraine is not winning the war, would change it to Ukraine winning the war and Russia is losing the war. All you need uh, for this is to give Ukrainians weapons and permission to strike against the Russian Federation, including Moscow. And then this war would be won very, very quickly. Otherwise, we are risking uh, full-scale open confrontation between NATO and the Russian Federation in the near future, uh, 25, 26. Well, there are so many uh, questions that come from that. I think we'll tackle Panamariev and the um, the non-vegetarian approach to uh, tackling Putin. If we characterize Navalny's peaceful approach based on uh, dreams, almost romanticism of a future Russia, we have Panamariev and other forces who are one would assume under the control uh, of uh, of Ukraine, um, making incursions into Kursk and Belgorod uh, oblasts. Um, 
And it seems to me that this makes the US extremely uncomfortable. And yet these incursions are potentially one of the few ways in which it could persuade perhaps Putin's regime that the, the risks of this war are raising on their side. Um, while the war is being fought on Ukrainian territory, um, is it not the case that there is really no risk whatsoever to Russian statehood, to the vertical structure, to the Sylvia Key, to Putin himself? It's only by taking the fight to Russia on its territory and significantly harming its economy that you might force any kind of rethink. Uh, this is true, of course, uh, entirely true. And again, at this point, uh, Ukrainians, not only they're not getting from, from uh, Europe and the United States everything they would like to have, but in addition to this, they're not uh, allowed to use uh, foreign weapons, uh, even machine guns, in their operations conducted against the Russian Federation. Uh, they are allowed to strike against their own uh, territory occupied by Russia. This is allowed, and this is kind of, I mean, this would be a joke, uh, but unfortunately we are talking about a very serious situation. So they are allowed to strike against um, a black, um, Russian black uh, sea fleet. They are allowed to strike against uh, Crimea, but not against the Russian Federation. So uh, the uh, the attempts of uh, Russian uh, uh, Russian anti-Putin forces to invade the Russian Federation uh, from Ukraine. There is nothing wrong with those uh, attempts, and they, I mean it's a good thing to do, uh, except that they do not, they're not too powerful, they do not have enough troops for very serious military operations. And again, unfortunately, since Russia is a country of one city, Moscow, Putin really doesn't care about Kursk or Belgorod. So what's important is Moscow, and 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 this is so. So the, the, the Ukrainians, of course, should concentrate uh, on on their ability to strike against Moscow and uh, the situation when Russia is striking regularly against Kiev and other major cities of Ukraine, but but against Kiev as well, uh, and Ukraine is not allowed to touch Moscow. This is a ridiculous situation. Is there is no way you are going to win a war without striking uh, the territory of Russian Federation and mainly again Moscow, because as I said, Putin doesn't care about Kursk and about Belgorod, and he doesn't care about Russia, Russians. Everything, everything in Russia is concentrated in Moscow, everything. All businesses are there, all, um, all money is there, uh, the richest people are there, uh, politicians are there, the, the ruling class is there. I mean, it's Moscow only nothing else so that's that's what you should do you should strike against the moscow if you plan to win the war if you do not plan to win the war and plan to continue business like it was done for the last two years i guess in a certain way it's 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 fine from European point of view, or especially from American point of view, because Americans are uh, very far away. Except, except that we we Ukraine is a much smaller country than uh, Russia, and unlike Russia, Ukraine cares about people which is losing in the war. And the, the uh, amount of those people in, is not unlimited in Russia. In a certain way, it's unlimited. In Ukraine, it is not. And uh, Ukraine especially, basically is not able to conduct this war as a permanent war. Unlike Russia, which uh, re you know, rebuilt its economy and at this point is able to conduct this war uh, forever, uh, both from economic point of view, from the point of view of weapons, from the point of view of manpower, and psychology, because as again, as Medvedev claimed in one of his texts, if we need dozens of years 
to this to destroy Ukraine, we will fight dozens of years, but we will destroy Ukraine. So this is not, of course, the Ukrainian approach, and it should not be. And then uh, the if 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 Europe loses Ukraine as a barrier which prevents a Russian invasion, then the situation would become worse for Europe, not, not better. And then in addition to everything, we have, of course, elections in the United States, which are coming in November. And we still do not understand who might be the president. And if this president is Donald Trump, we know what's going to happen on 21st of January, January 25, uh, he withdrew the United States from European affairs, not just from assistance to Ukraine. Uh, this would be, uh, you know, a terrible decision, but but Ukraine would survive this and Europe would survive this. He would withdraw the United States from European in affairs period. And then uh, the nuclear balance in Europe will be destroyed because Americans, you know, Europe would lose an American nuclear umbrella. And then having nuclear weapons in Belarus becomes a very risky uh, situation because then uh, Putin would, I think, inclined to strike with nuclear weapons from Belarus, uh, you know, kind of conducting kind of hybrid war, hybrid nuclear war in in Europe, uh, with understanding that no one would retaliate against Russia in this case. And it's questionable if you may retaliate with nuclear weapons against Belarus because it's a small country and radiation will would, you know, go across the borders. Uh, so that's that's what I think might be a very risky situation. So indeed, taking into account that there is a chance that Trump would become a president, I would prefer this war to be won before 21st of January 25. But for this, you have to give Ukrainians weapons and permission to use it. And I'm afraid this is not what's happening. We'll come back to that in a minute, because uh, Donbass and Crimea are pivotal to Ukrainian victory, and yet there seems to be a certain issue with uh, letting Ukraine uh, take those back. Um, but let's pick up that theme on losses, because it seems as well to me that a lot of the thinking in Washington, Berlin particularly, is projecting a certain kind of geopolitical um rationality or our rationality which doesn't exist there is perhaps the assumption that if uh, russia and ukraine are engaged in an attritional struggle at some point sense will prevail and russia in some ways cares about the losses economic losses losses of personnel in the way that that we might maybe it's slightly skewed but it seems the thinking is still to project our values onto Russia. You're saying, however, that there perhaps is no limit to what Putin is prepared to waste and annihilate in order to get his aims. And this is perhaps a fundamental misreading of the mindset of the Kremlin and those surrounding Putin by the Western powers. And probably the main one. You see, everybody was thinking or hoping that as soon as Russia would understand that Ukraine is not going to surrender, that Ukraine is going to fight, that this decision is very, you know, serious, and Russia is looking for a full-scale war, uh, again, Putin would change the strategy and say, all right, guys, Okay, you do not want to surrender. Well, let's talk about something else, right? But that's not what happened. And, uh, you know, Stalin Stalin was losing in all wars which he conducted. And he conducted uh, many wars, including, of course, the this, this, this Second World War as well. Uh, Stalin was losing millions of people. 
millions of Russian people. And according to public opinion polls in, in the Soviet Union and in post-Soviet uh, Russia, he is one of the most popular politicians. Because uh, what what uh, counts in Russia, not how many people you killed or how many people you know were, were killed, but uh, how many victories uh, you achieved, and uh, that's what uh, Putin I think uh, believes that it's not really important how many people are killed, and that Russians are. Uh, Indeed, do not really care if they are killed or not. And traditionally, a Russian life is very cheap, almost cost nothing. Uh, but what's important is uh, if you are bringing new territories and become and you know helping Russia to become an empire. And uh, this was sold, by the way, the, the idea that uh, Russia should be an empire, that Russia should exist as an empire, uh, this was easily sold to to public. And uh, you will not find too many Russians, uh, including those who are against Putin and against the war in Ukraine, uh, who would tell you that that they do not believe in empire, that they do not really believe that Russia has to exist as an empire. I mean, these are nice people, educated people. They do not want to have a war, but uh, but openly or deep inside, they still believe that there is nothing wrong for Russia uh, to exist as an empire, while for everybody else, uh, it's a wrong approach, and and I, I will give you an example. I mean, not an example, but what's actually is happening. When Putin is saying that uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union is geopolitical catastrophe and a major tragedy for for Russians, and the, that Russia has to exist as an empire, everybody is considering this. I mean, it's not that everybody is happy about this, but everybody is considering this. I mean, well, do Russia has this claim to to have Ukraine? I mean, they they had it for for some centuries. I mean, maybe there is something here, right? Maybe some other republics actually should should belong to the Russian Republic because they they always were. I mean, we are discussing this as if this is a normal claim. Let's say for the sake of the argument that a king of Britain would say tomorrow that the collapse of the British Empire is a major geopolitical catastrophe and tragedy for, for the British people. And he would like actually to, re, you know, rebuild the empire, to return to empire status. What would be reaction for this in the Great Britain and outside? What if what if Erdogan tomorrow would say that the collapse of the Ottoman Empire uh, was a major geopolitical catastrophe for Turkish people, and he would like you know to rebuild his empire? We would think that this is ridiculous. But when Putin is saying this, we are discussing it as if this is a normal claim. So this is a problem which is not just Russian. It's also a problem of, of, of the, the, the other world, right? Other countries looking at Russia as if it has the right uh, to to claim what other countries are not allowed to claim, basically, right? And uh, so partially in what's happening, uh, the, the, the you know civilized world is guilty uh, as well, because in 2006, during uh, economic uh, conference in St. Petersburg, 
where all heads of the states in, in well, major states at least of Europe were present. Uh, Putin actually said that they would like to have Belarus and Ukraine back. And uh, and not a single voice, uh, you know, was raised against this statement. Then in 2007, of course, in Munich, Putin basically was saying that he's unhappy with the United States trying to build, uh, you know, uh, one polar world. Uh, and Russia actually would like to 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 have a multipolar world. Indeed, it's all the opposite. The United States uh, is building multipolar world where all you know different regimes and different kind of governments uh, exist. While Russia is trying uh, to to have, of course, everybody under Russia's uh, control. So. So that's how it started. It starts with with uh, claims. It starts with uh, ideology. Is it starts with rhetoric, but then this rhetoric becomes reality, and then Russia tries to invade Georgia in two thousand eight, and basically no one is opposing. And then it takes Crimea, and again no one is opposing. And then, of course, it starts a full-scale, no, uh, full-scale uh, invasion to Ukraine. Now, for the first time since 2002, of course, uh, there is a real opposition to what Russia is doing. Um, but, uh, but again, a pro, uh, unfortunately, we are talking about a unique situation when, for the first time in world's history, a major state, a uh, nuclear state. Uh, is controlled by the state security, not by political parties, not by monarchs or dictators, but by a state security as the institution. And uh, these people were, you know, formed in 1917, in December of 1917, uh, in order to, to, you know, to kill, in order to, to take, in order to fight. And that's what they are trying to do, and that's what they are doing without any political control. In the Soviet Union, uh, KGB was existed as well, of course, this was similar, the same you know, kind of structure, uh, but, um, but it had political control in a form of Communist Party. This was not the best political party in the world, of course. But at least they had this conception of uh, peaceful coexistence with the West. Unlike the, the KGB, uh, which is now the FSB, has new conception formulated by Putin that Russia could win a nuclear war. And this is completely opposite to the theory of uh, peaceful coexistence, which secured the world, well, until recently, I would say. Uh, so that's that's what the problem is. That we are dealing, we are dealing not with a, with political parties which are ruling Russia, not with normal government which is ruling Russia. We are dealing with the FSB, and it's not by chance that uh, Putin mentioned twice in in two documentaries. One was made. Well, by his order, of course, about the invasion of 2014. And he was saying that the decision to invade was taken by three uh, chiefs of the FSB, uh, Putin as former uh, director of the FSB, Patrushev as former director of the FSB, and Bortnikov, the, the current director of, FSB, of the FSB. And the decision to invade in 22 was made by same three people, Putin, Patrushev, and Portnikov. So these are people who rule Russia, and this is not the Russian parliament, which basically doesn't exist. This is not the, the cabinet of ministers, which which is just a technical help. But but three triumvirate uh, from three uh, directors of the FSB. 
and uh, these people are trained to to kill. They are not trained to to negotiate. They're also trained to lie. One of the questions that I wanted to ask is one of the features of not just Russian propaganda, but public figures, public communication. That behavior is then copied down through, uh, you know, the Z patrons and so on. But it is almost a pathological need to lie continuously and lie on a scale that Goebbels would have been, I think, impressed at. What is the source of this use of vranyo or lies as an instrument of coercion, aggression? Well, we are talking about a country uh, which, uh, and I do not really want to, to go too much into history, but we are talking about a country which was absolute monarchy until 1917, uh, communist dictatorship until 1991, had very short and very troubled period of attempts to become part of Europe and to become democracy in a period between 91 and 99 and then became again uh, a, a dictatorship under the, the FSB. So uh, the, the uh, democratic period of Russia has a short history of nine years, and even those nine years were not ideal. And uh, the freedom of press which existed in Russia probably existed between 1990 and 2000. Uh, from the day when Putin became president, they started to shut down and to confiscate uh, oppositionist uh, newspapers. And the first empire, which was unfriendly to, to Putin, was the uh, empire of Vladimir Gusinsky, who had his uh, well-known channel NTV, with, which was well respected. And they shut it down, then they st started to close his newspapers, etc., etc. Uh, in 2003, they arrested Michael Khodorkovsky, who positioned himself as an independent businessman with the attempt to influence Russian politics, and they ruined his company, Yukos. Uh, you know, they, they just in the recent weeks, by the way, Yukos won finally a criminal case against, well, civil case, I probably should say, against the Russian Federation, and now the Russian Federation is obliged by international court to pay, uh, you know, uh, owners of Yukos um, $50 billion. I, I actually would like to see how this is going to happen. But, but anyway, after 2003, even oligarchs stopped to exist in Russia. They became just uh, rich people on the conditions that they allowed to be rich as long as they support the government. So this is a very short history of, of freedom or democracy uh, in Russia. And, and this is the answer to the question why it's very easy to lie. Because that's how Russian people lived for generations and generations and generations. And uh, again, taking into account that life is very cheap in Russia and Russians are very cynical because of this. And they do not really expect to die of natural, <laughs> for, for natural reasons. They expect that something would happen to them. Um, that's why you see... Uh, you know, except for small percentage of people who emigrated, who are not happy with, you know, what's happening in Russia and choose to emigrate. But the entire country cannot emigrate. This has never happened in, in world's history. So the majority of people, of course, are either supporting what's going on or basically do not care, right? So kind of neutral. And uh, that's why uh, you have this Russian propaganda, which is one-way street. There is no um, return connection, right? There is no re really connection between a TV set, which produces some information and listeners on the other end. Uh, they do not care whether people believe them or not. Uh, there is no, There are no public opinion polls, which you know, to collect information about this. We do not really know how 
popular Putin is, and he doesn't care if he is popular or not. Uh, beyond the, the fact that it's officially said that he had like 87% of support, what is ridiculous, he could not, I mean... And that's so more than the previous elections, not, isn't it? It's actually gone, gone up with each election. The it's proportion gone up, it's gone up. And that's, I think, what was happening. You see, after annexation of Crimea, the, the Russian uh, state media was saying that 86% um, of Russians supported occupation of Crimea. And, I mean, I do not know if this was 86, but it was true that the majority of Russians speaking about imperialism and the, the uh, you know, the desire to become an empire supported the occupation of Crimea, especially because it was you know, conducted without bloodshed and without real war, and just one person was killed. Uh, so uh, we, we could believe that majority of Russians supported the occupation of Crimea. But by those people who were thinking uh, what percentage they should, uh, you know, write for Putin, knew that they could not go below 86 because then the conclusion would be that Putin lost some votes because of war, because of real war in Ukraine. So they decided to go higher, but just a little bit. So, you know, people would kind of believe this. And so they came with the 87 point, whatever, 2 or 0.4. But but you know, but the problem is that uh, in Russia, uh, by law, the, the electoral computer, which you know calculates the votes, is controlled by the FSB. This is a joke, but I mean, this could be a joke, but this is by law officially, and they also introduced some time ago a, a remote. A voting system, uh, which would be great. I mean, in a places like Russia, a huge country where there are no roads sometimes and people would need to travel who knows where to, to vote, to, to be allowed to vote remotely, this would be great. Except that in Russia, uh, this, of course, gives the government the opportunity to add to a favorite candidate uh, those uh, votes of those people who did not come to vote. And that's precisely, of course, what's happening. That's why uh, the selections, unlike any others, not only they conducted them for three days instead of one day, but they also, of course, claim that more people participated in this election than in any previous ones. So it's, it's a Barely wow. credible, barely credible. Wow, isn't it? right. Wow, complete victory for Putin, of course. But um, uh, but I guess it doesn't uh, matter even for him whether this complete uh, victory or not. Uh, uh, what's important for him, if he would be able again to collect those 100,000 people for, for the fighting in, in Ukraine and whether he would be able to uh, continue with his war because he's not ready to stop. And my last question is really um, centre on that. It's the lack of imagination, the fact that we have um, not just parted from our imperial pasts, we have perhaps forgotten the techniques that we used to coerce and control the populations that came within our empires. We've, we've moved on and forgotten what that was like and, and what we did. And therefore, it's difficult, I think, for us to imagine what Russia is capable of and difficult for us to uh, understand the techniques, even though they are relatively simple and they're repeated over and over. If we are to stop Ukraine, uh, stop Russia in Ukraine, I think it's perfectly possible. Uh, we're not doing it because we fear they will escalate against us with nuclear weapons and so on. But there are other scenarios uh, for Russian behavior. One of those scenarios would be that if they are stopped from advancing in Ukraine, well, there are other territories that formed part of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Empire, and that is Central Asia. 
Georgia, Armenia, and propagandists have been making ongoing threats to all of these places whenever they express any kind of uh, independence from Moscow, whenever they use their native languages um, as opposed to, to Russian and exert their cultural identity, they get uh, extraordinary threats made against them. The aggression of Moscow won't go away. I don't think we appreciate that, but that aggression could be directed at other places if we push it back from the frontiers of Europe. Do you think this is a risk? And should we be imagining, should we try to imagine all scenarios? Well, no, I think it's actually the, the opposite. You see, the only problem with Russia, and there are a lot of people usually when, when we have conferences, right, or discussions, the question is what's wrong with Russia? Actually, nothing is wrong with Russia. And nothing is wrong with Russians, except that Russia has to stop about itself, as if it has at must to exist as an empire. This is the only problem with Russia. Everything else would work perfectly. Russians just have to stop to believe that Russia should exist as an empire, and that Russians are are very special if I mean if and you can just should not couldn't compare them with other nations or other countries because it's ridiculous because the Russians are great while all other people are not and uh, this is uh, a sincere belief which which you see every time to you start to talk to to Russians and uh, again, even some also, opposition Russians. I mean, let's face it, there's an exceptionalism. Which, yeah. Even even educational educated Russians, even these who who do not believe in war and uh, uh, to those who hate uh, Putin, but uh, still they would have difficulties if you ask them if, you know, a Russian and Chechen uh, are equal and, and say, well, or, or a Tatar or a Ukrainian or a Belarusian or any other nation. Actually, uh, you probably will hear the same answer if you ask uh, them if uh, a Russian and Englishman uh, are equal. Probably not. And the the uh, argument which you will hear, what is also very interesting, uh, that, well, look, you know, there is a great Russian culture, you know, Pushkin, uh, Lermontov, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Tchaikovsky, you know, Brodsky, Solzhenitsyn. And then you look at those people, you know, who are actually you know, representing the, the great Russian culture. Pushkin was uh, exiled, punished, and they all killed, uh, you know, during the duel. Lermontov was exiled, uh, punished, and at the end killed uh, during the, in the duel. Uh, Tolstoy was excommunicated by the Russian church. Uh, Dostoevsky was sentenced to death. Uh, they uh, went through kind of uh, uh, execution, and at the end was not executed by sent to to Katarga, right to uh, to to you know to to Siberia for for many years. Uh, Solzhenitsyn was sent to concentration camps. Zabrotsky was exiled. Tchaikovsky actually was uh, basically, you, you know, uh, killed because uh, he was a gay and, you know, they, he, because of this, he, the society didn't accept him. I mean, every other, you know, Bulgakov, Mikhail Bulgakov was uh, basically killed. Uh, Mandelstam was killed. Uh, Akhmatov and Akhmatov, a Russian poet, her husband, uh, another poet, uh, Gumilov was killed and her son was put in, in prison. Uh, I mean, uh, you could take any person. Uh, they survived and became part of the Russian culture, not because of the Russian state or Soviet state, but, uh, you know, despite the uh, attempts of the 
state to 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 murder them and at the end many of them were killed so but that's what uh, this is forgotten by those uh, russians who are arguing for great russian culture uh, and great russian state and unfortunately they somehow think that the stronger is the state, the better is for nation. Indeed, this is a very questionable theory, generally speaking. And in case of Russia, this is completely wrong. The weaker the state, the better for people. Uh, but but again, that's not uh, not how Russians are educated. Russians are educated uh, in in a way that was what's good for the state is good for you. Uh, again, this goes against the, basically the Western understanding of, of of the life. Not necessarily what's good for you is good for you, and the state has nothing actually to do with this. Uh, the state is a state, and your life is your life. But uh, but that's what's wrong uh, with Russia. Uh, Russians has to accept the fact that a period uh, of uh, imperial period is over. I mean, it was over in 1918, uh, but it definitely was over in 1991, and they they should forget about imperialism and should think about the self as a, just an, another, you know, European or Asian European uh, nation then everything would become normal in Russia. But uh, unfortunately, as we know from uh, the, the lessons of the Second World War, uh, looking at Germany, looking at Japan, in order to change, uh, you have to be defeated in the war. And that, this defeat will come. That's what's happening now. Russia started the war. Uh, uh, where uh, Russia will be defeated. The problem is that we do not know how long this war would continue and what the price of this defeat is going to be uh, for both Russia and the world. This is still an open question, but I'm slightly, uh, well, nervous about our future. And of course, it requires people to accept not only they're defeated, but for the propagandists, the media infrastructure, the leadership to accept that truth rather than to spin further lies. I remember drinking beer on the roof of Engel in 1990 with some friends and Russians. And, you know, the question that came up is... Um, does this country know it's lost the Cold War? And we came to the conclusion back then that no, it hadn't accepted that it had lost. It hadn't accepted that that was over. And I think it was quite clear, you know, even before that liberal period set in, that there was no such conception of uh, empire. There was deep regret and nostalgia for various territories uh, that had been lost, Eastern Europe, the Baltics, and so on. There was a high degree of resentment, but no concept whatsoever that the core of the Russian Empire um, uh, had ceased to, uh, to, to have meaning. Um, and here we are, uh, however many years later. Oh, precisely. And also, again, if we're talking about lessons of history or mistakes which were made, uh, the, the one obvious mistake, uh, well, this was an obvious mistake, but I do not want to sound uh, as a person who claims that this was easy to do. Uh, the, the crimes committed by Communist Party was never actually, you know, discussed by, by, by the nation. The crimes committed by the KGB was never discussed by the nation. And that's why uh, the Communists, of course, did not... Uh, survive for the, the 1991 collapse but the FSB did and uh, this is one of the this is the price we are paying now uh, for not um, you know not uh, sentencing uh, both the Communist Party and the KGB for crimes committed against humanity during the period of 1917 to 1991. Um, 
but uh, but again, I do not want to say that this was easy to do. This was not because the, the FSB, uh, the former KGB, was in many ways in control all those years, uh, despite of the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. And uh, and again, uh, they came back, as we know, very quickly and took power very quickly. And historically, you know, this is democratic Russia existed for nine years, which is nothing, right? And in 2000, it was already under the control of the FSB. But uh, but that's what should be done. And uh, will it take time? Yes, it will take time. And I think we know how long. Uh, we think we know how long it, it took Europe to pardon Germany for crimes committed during the Second World War. And I, I would say that it took probably 70 to 80 years. And I expect something similar to happen after this, the, the end of this war, because, you know, Ukrainians probably would never, uh, you know, pardon Russia for what Russia done. And probably all those people who live in both Russia and Ukraine would have to, to be gone first and only new generations would start to look differently at Russia and this probably would relate to, to Europe, especially if this war widens and if Russia would try to uh, to attempt to invade other countries, what, what I think is very possible. And uh, Germans just published reports that they expect this invasion to take place in 25. Uh, prior to this announcement about a new 100,000 people, I was thinking that Russia would not have troops for this invasion, but maybe this new 100,000 is going to be dedicated to, to to fight uh, against uh, other European nations, so we, we will see. But it it doesn't look it doesn't look too too bright for us. It doesn't look uh, very the future doesn't look peaceful. And and once again, I think uh, Europe uh, has to be ready for war. If we would be able to avoid it, this would be great. But uh, I'm not convinced that this is possible because uh, it's the aggression, aggressor who actually decides to attack and to invade. And there is nothing what you could do against this. We, we couldn't do anything uh, in case of invasion of Ukraine in 22. I mean, we probably could, but we didn't. And I do not know how much we could do to stop Putin from further invasions if he plans to, to have them. And the very last thought uh, on that, again, it's a failure, I think, of our imagination because we try to look for patterns in history and because we don't see those exact same patterns, we don't see the warning or threat. Um, so because Russia isn't behaving exactly like Stalin's Russia or like the Third Reich, um, because it's following a different course of events, we perhaps don't see the scale of the threat. One of those, of course, is the Gulag. And it seems to me that the FSB has reestablished the Gulag, but because it is not in the traditional place where it is in Siberia, it's not on that same scale. They've established the, the, the Gulag in Donbass. They've outsourced it as part of the SVO, the Special Operation and the scale of torture, impunity, illegality is all there on the territory of Donbass. And of course, it's, you know, if they want to exile people to their deaths, um, people who uh, support Navalny went to lay flowers on the Solovetsky stone or, or do something, you know, more demonstrable than that. Well, they've got a very easy gulag to send them to, and that is to the special military operation where they will not survive and come back from. Uh, again, I think we fail to recognize this process of terror that is uh, that is unfolding. Well, uh, we uh, we also have difficulties to imagine that something irrational is going to happen, right? Uh, uh, let's put it this way. In 2013, 
not too many people would expect that Russia would invade Crimea. If 2021, not too many people were expecting that Russia would start a full-scale nuclear war. We probably could say the same about the Second World War. Not too many people were expecting in 1938 that Germany would start the Second World War, as a result of which uh, 60 million people uh, will end uh, dead. Uh, so our expectations are usually much uh, less... Uh, uh, dramatic uh, than the reality. Uh, it's probably normal for for people, but uh, but it does not uh, really help us. Uh, Soviet Union existed in the format of closed borders uh, and without market economy. Uh, the the Stalin, of course, was killing people by millions. Uh, the, today's Russia exists. Uh, with the open borders, with market economy. Now, uh, this uh, allows uh, those Russians who are unhappy, let's put it this way, uh, to immigrate from, from Russia to some other countries. And to, by the way, when you travel uh, in, in now, uh, you, you see those Russians, there are a lot of them, and this is the main language uh, except the native one in basically every country you know in in, in uh, georgia in in uh, lithuania in, in poland uh, Kazakhstan, uzbekistan uh, yeah. anyway mongolia right? yeah. and this is of course an indication that a lot of people were unhappy with uh, what putin is uh, doing but but this does not uh but this allowed allows Putin to exist uh, and conduct his activity without major terror. Because if the border is closed, and if all those people who are, who are against him, if they're inside the Russian Federation, then of course uh, you have a com comparatively large, uh, you know, oppositionist movement in in Russia, and probably the government would be forced, of course, to to you know to apply terror to those people, arrest them, put them in prison. There is no death penalty, so you cannot execute them. So you have to hold them somewhere, and. Uh, uh, I, I, I think the decision was uh, made by, by Kremlin that it's actually safer for them, for the regime, to keep the open, uh, border open. So since uh, the entire country could not <laughs> immigrate, uh, then, of course, uh, only those people who are fine with, with uh, what's happening uh, are left in, in Russia. And those who are not happy and those who are in a position, there are not too many of them. And those you you always could put in prisons. And, and we see this. There are like several thousand people probably who were arrested and are in prison for their political uh, thoughts and, and activity. But... Uh, but again, that's that's uh, this is a format in which Russia uh, seems to be could exist uh, forever, uh, because again there is no there are no internal forces which would change the regime, and uh, and people who are uh, in charge of Russia, uh, you know they 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 are not they're not going to give power away. I mean, this is not going to happen. It's not that at one particular point, Putin would say, all right, fine. I mean, he's not frank, in other words. Uh, this is not, uh, this is not a, a case of a clever dictatorship, right? Or, or a educated monarch, uh, right? Uh, he is lieutenant colonel of the FSB who just happened to be president of Russia and and happened to hold this position for a quarter of the century. But he's still a, a lieutenant colonel of the FSB, nothing, nothing more. And we intend to forget this. We, we think that he is like, uh, you know, well, 
Greg Putin. He's not Greg Putin. He's the turn colonel of the Hizbi. Yuri, thank you so much for speaking to the channel. It's always extremely thrilling and compelling and obviously uh, dark and terrifying at the same time. I think your insights are incredibly important at this moment in history. And I hope some decision makers hear your voice and others like yours um, and uh, alter their strategy before uh, it's too late. Thank you so much for coming Thank on the channel again. Much. Thank you for your time. Brilliant.